Am I allowed to say I remember you at her age? And I wasn't so different. You weren't so different. You think you're being hard on her, and I think you're being hard on yourself. Actor Stephen McKinley Henderson, known for his performances as collected, wise characters in projects like Lady Bird, Dune, Devs, and Civil War, is my dad. Not in real life, but in, in my head. He gives off this real calm, soothing vibe. That there's just something about him. I, I just want to listen to his wisdom, maybe have a drink or two, smoke a cigar, and give him a hug, and then maybe he can just look me right in the eyes and tell me that it's, it's not my fault, and I'm doing great. I really am. I'm doing great. I bet he smells vaguely of coconut and old spice. That's the feeling I get when I watch his performances. More often than not, Steven has played these kinds of mentor characters. He exudes a worldliness that only comes with experience and age. Ever since I first saw him playing a Catholic drama teacher in Lady Bird, I thought, where did this guy come from? Well, now I know, and it's my privilege to share with you the origin story of one of my favorite supporting players working today. His early roles, his big ones, his small ones, and my personal favorites. And as always, I want to give a special thanks to our patrons over on the Back Focus Patreon. Check it out if you'd like to help support this channel. Way back in the 1960s, Stephen McKinley Henderson bounced around at several colleges. He first attended Juilliard in 1968 when he was 19, but he had trouble focusing on his craft for multiple reasons. He cited competitiveness with fellow students being a factor, and not to mention it was 1968, so I mean, it was one of the worst years imaginable. Multiple people assassinated, civil rights is at its peak, and he developed a certain kind of survivor's guilt in a way. With an older brother who was deaf and a younger sister who suffered from a muscular disease, Stephen asked himself, quote, Why me? Why should I be doing so well? Why should I have a scholarship to come to New York and study in the first class of actors at Juilliard? Eventually, Stephen checked himself into the Western Missouri Mental Health Center. After being picked up from his home, put in a straitjacket with a shotgun under his chin, he was confined to a wheelchair, convinced that he no longer had the ability to walk. The only reason he even got out of the wheelchair some days later and began to talk again was when a fellow patient was annoyingly misquoting Hamlet. And Stephen proceeded to correct him. Quote, That's when I started to realize why I was there. I came there to get myself straight, but once I went through that straitjacket and that shotgun, I went all the way to a whole other place. And then I realized where I had been, where I had come from, that I had been at the Juilliard School, and all this other stuff started coming back to me. Stephen then finished his BFA in acting at North Carolina School of the Arts, and finally got his Master's of Arts in Theater at Purdue University in 1977. He moved to Buffalo, New York in the early 80s, performing countless plays. I mean, it's just, I can't, every time I found an interview there was another play I learned that he did. There's, there's no way to quantify it. And then he became an assistant professor in the Department of Theater and Dance at the University of Buffalo in 1987. But just because he was teaching didn't mean he wasn't acting. In 1984, he played Mr. Cheeks, who helps newcomers to Chicago find jobs during World War I in an American Playhouse movie, The Killing Floor. Now you boys get settled in and you want to write your folks and tell them how good you're doing? Just come on back here to the YMCA and see Mr. Cheeks. Cheeks is an interesting character. You know, he's not a fighter. He's become complacent with his place in the hierarchy of race in Chicago and insists every other black person treat the white people with respect. You might call him an Uncle Tom character. You need to be careful now, young man. You might be up north, but you still got to stay in your place. There was also an American Playhouse production of Raisin in the Sun, which he had already done off-Broadway. He played Bobo, an honest working man trying to help his friend Walter start a liquor business, but becomes the bearer of bad news when he tells him that their other business partner, Willie, ran off with the money they invested. I waited in that train station six hours. Man, Willie is gone. While teaching at UB and performing on stage, Stephen started getting guest roles on television, especially in procedural crime dramas. He was very active on Law & Order, appearing in 10 episodes over three different Law & Order series, playing one type of character, a judge. 
I order you to undergo a paternity test within the next two weeks. Of course he played judges. Sustain. I mean, I don't know why, of course. It just, it fits. Well, I, he comes off like a man of authority. He, he looks good in a robe. I don't, he, with the little the spectacles on his nose and looks like he would get you into his chambers. We gotta, we gotta talk about this case. There's no nonsense. I will not allow my courtroom to turn into a three ring circus. I suggest you talk to your client about a plea counselor. Other supporting roles followed like a therapist and the good heart, a locksmith and extremely loud and incredibly close and a doorman and tower heist. Now this is a kind of forgettable movie, but I love Steven's chemistry with Ben Stiller. You can really see the history that these two characters have. Be thinking about how you danced on that bar. Yeah, I got it all up here. Oh, where you got that? Circle of life, Josh. Circle of life. Not only is he funny and charming in this role, but he's also able to draw the sympathy needed for the plot when his character loses all of his money to a wealthy employer's Ponzi scheme. A couple of months ago, I gave him everything I had, my life savings. Six years working the back door at the Waldorf, nine at the Carlisle, three at the Pierre, 11 with you at the Tower. That's 29 years of opening doors. Then Steven's first big movie was in 2012 when he ended up working with Steven Spielberg playing real life historical figure William Slade, personal valet and messenger to Abraham Lincoln in Lincoln. When you're a slave, Mr. Slade, did they beat you? I was born a free man. Nobody beat me except I beat them right back. He's a minor character, but he's woven perfectly into the tapestry of the supporting cast, and even gets this moment near the end as Lincoln's walking off to Ford Theater, like he feels instinctively that this will be the last time he sees him, or maybe he's just grateful. But hey, yeah, Lincoln could come back in the sequel, who knows? Now again, it's important to remember that during all these years, Stephen was still teaching at BU, still performing on stage, off and on Broadway. He became friends with one particularly renowned playwright, August Wilson, playing characters in around 15 productions of his plays, one of which was Fences. Stephen played Bono, a loyal friend to Denzel Washington's character Troy, a former Negro League baseball player turned sanitation worker. Stephen was nominated for a Tony Award for his performance and reprised the role along with much of the original cast in a film adaptation in 2016. Stephen's character shares similar characteristics to some other ones he would eventually play. Oh, okay. <laughs> I love you too. I got to get home, see my woman. You got yours in hand. I got to go get mine. He's wise, he's personable, kind, and a good friend who's not afraid to tell it like it is. Like when he confronts Troy about an extramarital affair that Troy's been having. She loves you, Troy. Rose loves you. You saying I don't measure up? That's what you're trying to say. I don't measure up because I'm seeing this other gal. I know what you're trying to say. I know what Rose means to you, Troy. I'm just trying to say I don't want to see you mess up. I just say that because I love you both. Now, I don't know exactly how many times Denzel and Steven performed these scenes together prior to shooting the film, but all I know is that you can see it. They have a natural chemistry and rhythm that just cannot be replicated. The same year, he appeared briefly in Manchester by the Sea as Casey Affleck's character's boss. It's a short scene, but I, I just, I love the exchange here. What the f the matter with you? You can't talk to the tenants like that. He's just got that stern father voice, just cuts through you like a knife. He doesn't even have to move or throw anything. You, you know, you, like, you know you messed up when Stephen McKinley Henderson talks to you like that. The following year, Stephen played a character kind of similar to himself, a drama teacher in Lady Bird. Take it away, Lady Bird. Everybody says don't, everybody says don't, everybody says don't, it isn't right. This scene especially is so similar to what he would actually do in his classes at UB. Because it's not important to be right, it's only important to be true. Exactly. That quote, that right there, it's not important to be right, it's important to be true, that is lifted straight from his lectures. He would say that all the time to his students. You want to do this? Get it true. Don't get it right. In a 2021 interview for The Hollywood Reporter, Stephen said, quote, I thought it was wonderful in Greta's film because she let me really have a class with them. And this was something that had been written in. It's a great role for him. The whole tone of the film seamlessly intertwines comedy and drama. And I remember laughing really hard at this scene where he challenges everyone, including himself, to be the first one to cry on command. <laughs> oh. 
I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The comedic timing of it is perfect, but there's actual tragedy behind it, as it's implied that the character's son had died years ago. Similarly, this moment with Beanie Feldstein's character after a showing of the play has tinges of ab absurdity and sadness. They didn't understand it. There is a deep depression in this performance which is never fully explained. Like a lot of teachers who are looked up to, he hides his fragility for the sake of the students. We do get a little glimpse at his heartbreak when he goes to check himself into a mental facility that Lady Bird's mom works at. I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry. There's no wrong answer. Please don't tell your daughter. No, of course not. I don't think I've ever seen such an accurate portrayal of depression in such a short period of time. Like, there's not just the hopelessness of the depression, but then there's, there's this shame that he even feels this way. And it's really, it's just heartbreaking. At this point in his career, Stephen had retired from his teaching job at UB and has just been acting full time ever since. And he's been working nonstop, a terminally ill patient in the resident to a no-nonsense coach in Bruised. Welcome back. Then he started his collaboration with Alex Garland when he played Stuart, a senior engineer at a mysterious tech company messing around with quantum mechanics in the sci-fi miniseries Devs. Is it morning already? It's places like Vegas, I never know what time it is. He's in full-on mentor mode here, albeit with a little tough love, especially with Kaylee Spaney's character, Lyndon. I don't know shit about music. Please. Listen to a lot of Bach, a lot of Coltrane? No. Then shut the f up. But as their research progresses, Stuart becomes increasingly concerned about the long-term ramifications of what they're doing. Such big decisions being made about our future by people who know so little about our past. Isn't knowing our past exactly what we're doing here? No. While he was working on Devs, Stephen got a call from Denis Villeneuve. I think I'm saying that right. Denis Villeneuve. Denis was casting for Dune, and he was looking for someone very specific. Stephen, I wanted uh, an actor that uh, will have a lot of intelligence in the eyes, and at the same time will be like a teddy bear. So Stephen played Thufir Hawat. I think I'm saying that right. Thufir Hawat. An unwaveringly loyal advisor to House Atreides, who acts as a strategist and as a mentat. He's a one-man supercomputer. How much will it cost them, traveling all this way for this formality? Three Guild Navigators, a total of 1.46 million 62 salaries round trip. And I love this little tidbit here. So apparently Steven's character's parasol was just an on-set umbrella that the actors would use to stay in the shade. In a 2021 interview for Vulture, Steven recalled that Denis walked over to him and said, Ah, you like this? I said, yeah, I love it. And he said, well, I think Thufir can have this. And I said, I would love to do that. That's fabulous. Steven's mentor aura also comes in handy when he plays doctors. In the 2022 drama Causeway, he's an empathetic yet pragmatic doctor who's hesitant to sign off on Jennifer Lawrence's character's request to return to the army so soon after a PTSD diagnosis. I feel fine. Is it possible you feel fine because of the Cymbalta? Once again, he's playing a character who's just seen some things, right? He's got life experience, and he's just trying to impart some wisdom to others, no matter how stubborn they can be. In the same vein, he played a therapist to Joaquin Phoenix's emotionally numb, paranoid beau, who's dreading going home to visit his mother. Are well, you feeling guilty about that? Which brings us to Civil War, Stephen's second project with Alex Garland. This one might be my favorite of his. His character, Sammy, is a veteran journalist who's seen it all and embarks on a road trip with fellow journalists to Washington, D.C. to hopefully get a big scoop on the ensuing unrest in the country. You don't want to miss this. Sammy is truly the heart of the film and is simultaneously a wise mentor and teacher and a true friend. Of course, he plays a pivotal role in probably the film's most talked about scene involving Jesse Plemons. If we go down there, they're going to kill us. We've got to press passes. You're cool. 
Those people do not want to be seen doing what they're doing. Why don't they listen to him? Seriously, at this point, everyone should just listen to whatever Stephen McKinley Henderson says. Get in the car! Get in the f***ing car! This film actually provides some insight on what it was like to work with Steven. I found this montage of cast members just singing his praises. Oh. There's like not enough time in the day to talk about Steven. He's an angel of a man. He's funny and he's good natured. That has an effect on the shoot. I can just give him stuff. He will do something better than whatever it was that was in my mind. He's sort of the glue. He like grounds all of us, I think. I think he's one of the best people I know. And he teaches you things without even saying anything to you. That's how he is in the movie. He's our mentor, a godlike yeah. spirit in, yeah. within yeah. Stephen. He's a very special bloke. He also got cut out of Dune 2, motherfuckers. It's interesting how just being a nice guy and bringing a chill vibe to a film set can have such a profound effect on the cast. If you dig back even further, on Lady Bird, Beanie Feldstein was asked about her favorite moment working on the film. She said, quote, "...probably any time Stephen McKinley Henderson is on screen because he is the love of my life. I want to hold his hand and take all of his wisdom." And there are countless examples of this, actors, directors, and writers having just amazing things to say about Stephen, and I think that goes a long way. To have a reputation for not just being a reliable actor, but just being a nice guy, putting good energy out into the world. And his story just by itself is inspiring, from his struggles in his early years to finding success in the late innings. And thanks to his experience being a teacher for so many years, his roles reflect that ability to mentor others and be a source of inspiration. So yeah, Stephen McKinley Henderson may not be my dad. Maybe. But at the end of the day, I don't think I'm alone when I say that I still look up to him.